You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. This holiday season, Lululemon makes it easy to give a gift that goes beyond the moment they open it. There's the sound of them unboxing super soft Lululemon loungewear. And then there's the sound of them slipping into deep recovery mode after every workout. With Lululemon, the real gift happens when they're living in it. Open the moment. Shop now at lululemon.com. Did you know using your browser in incognito mode doesn't actually protect your privacy? Take back your privacy with IPVanish VPN. Just one tap and all your data, passwords, communications, browsing history, and more will be instantly protected. IPVanish makes you virtually invisible online. Use IPVanish on all your devices, anytime you go online at home and especially on public Wi-Fi. Get IPVanish now for 70% off a yearly plan with this exclusive offer at IPVanish.com slash audio. Deception, lies, fraudulence, and forgery. This is what Intelligent Speech 2025 will be bringing you. We are delighted to announce three outstanding keynote speakers. We have Joe from the awesome Fake History Hunter Twitter feed and author of Fake History. There's Otto English, author of Another Fake History and Fake Heroes, and presenter of the Utter Bollocks podcast. And finally, we have somebody you might have heard of. Um, me host of the History of the Great War and History of the Second World War podcasts. I hope you will join me and the other keynote speakers and a whole list of other presenters at Intelligent Speech 2025, which has been given the theme of deception. It will be taking place on the 8th of February, 2025, and you can go to intelligentspeechonline.com to find out more information. And... There's a special bonus offer, because if you act now, you'll be able to take advantage of a special offer just for listeners of this podcast right now, you, the people I'm talking to. Because when you buy your ticket, you can enter promo code SECOND, that's S-E-C-O-N-D, at checkout to receive an additional 10% off the already discounted ticket price, because we're still early in the process. So that's a pretty great deal. There's going to be a ton of content, a ton of awesome speakers, including yours truly. So you can go to intelligentspeechonline.com and use the promo code SECOND at checkout to get your special bonus 10% off. Thank you for listening, and let's get to the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 200, Case Red. Hard to believe we are already at 200. That's a lot. But this week, a big thank you goes out to Ryan and Stuart and Sam and Nicholas, who've chosen to support the podcast by becoming members. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. Did you know that you can also gift podcast memberships to others? You can find a link to do that on the members page just in case you know anybody who would like maybe a a 30-minute deep dive into a single British government memorandum from 1940, or an upcoming two-part biography on Marshal Philippe Pétain, a man who, well, he certainly made some choices, didn't he? Find out about that and many more topics by becoming a member over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. After the German successes of the first 10 days of their attack into France, during which they had advanced from the French and Belgian border all the way to the North Sea, both sides had been solely focused on those events. However, in the days after this tremendous accomplishment, both sides had shifted focus onto preparing for what was to come next, the expected German second phase of their offensive. On the German side, this involved planning for what they would do to push further into France, with the objective of destroying the rest of the Allied military forces. On the French side, they were preparing to meet that offensive in whatever way they could. General Vagon, the commander of all French military forces, had made the decision that the French army would make its stand in the positions that had been frantically established along the Somme and Anne rivers. These positions had been established to contain the German advance of the previous weeks, and would now be manned by as many French divisions as possible. The French would also be using a different defensive technique than what had been used during the earlier attacks, with a heavy focus on the creation of strong points built around villages and towns 
with gaps between those strong points covered by artillery and mobile forces. In theory, this was not the worst idea, and it helped the French to make up for the numerical deficits that they found themselves working under. But it also put a heavy emphasis on two requirements, a steadfast defense from those forces inside the strong points, even when they were at risk of being surrounded, and then rapid and powerful responses to any German penetrations to prevent those strong points from simply being cut off and destroyed. The fate of France depended on the French military meeting those two requirements. Even before the Germans would launch their attack, they would, of course, seek to use their almost total domination of the air that they had gained since the start of the campaign to further disrupt French forces in preparations. On June 1st, the number of Luftwaffe attacks would begin to escalate, and it even included French targets far away from the front. For example, on the 1st of June, German Ju-88 bombers would visit the French port city of Marseille, targeting the docks within the city, and they were successful in this attack, with a British troop ship catching fire and a French auxiliary cruiser damaged beyond repair. While Marseille was far away from the battlefields in the north, it was an important target due to the growing importance and even greater future importance of French troops from their North African colonies. However, these bombing raids in the south were not really that important to the overall course of the coming attacks. They might have been if the French had resisted longer than they would in June 1940, but as it was, uh, things were just kind of over too quickly. While these bombing raids were occurring in the south of France, the main strength of the Luftwaffe was preparing for their real effort in the north, particularly in a series of bombing raids on Paris and the areas surrounding the city. These would begin on the afternoon of June 3rd and would feature more than 200 German bombers and of course a large number of escorting fighters. They would target a variety of areas in and around the city, including government buildings like the Air Ministry, of factories like those of Citroën and Renault, and then 16 airfields that were positioned around the city. A total of 20 French aircraft would be destroyed or heavily damaged in these attacks on these airfields, just adding to the woes experienced by the French Air Force over the previous weeks. However, it was not all bad news for the French in the air, because in a weird way, even with their losses of over 330 fighters since May 10th, in some ways, their fighter force was in a better spot in June than it was in May. This is because just under 330 fighter aircraft had been received as replacements for those lost, but they were generally newer and higher quality designs. The problem was, of course, finding pilots to fly these replacements, because around 40% of the fighter pilots with which France had started the campaign had been killed, wounded, or captured. This meant that they were more reliant than ever on Czech and Polish pilots who had managed to find their way to France after the German invasion of their countries. What none of these pilots, or the French in the air, could depend on was the strong support from the British. Now, there were still British fighters in France, but they amounted to just three hurricane squadrons, far from a full commitment to the continent by the RAF for the reasons that we've discussed over the previous episodes. The pilots that were available over Paris were able to destroy 10 German aircraft during the raids on Paris on June 3rd, although they would also lose 10 French fighters in their efforts. During the night of June 4th into the 5th, both the French and British would then launch bombing raids over Germany, kind of in retaliation, but it was quite telling that while the Germans were willing and able to stage their bombing attacks during broad daylight, which made them far more likely to actually find their targets, the Allied bombers were forced to fly at night. This protected them from attacks by German fighters, but made it very challenging to actually find the thing that they were trying to bomb. Although the, the French bombers would actually end up being a little better at this than the British, who did not even really have the kind of proper nighttime navigation aids within their bombers, which meant they were mostly just guessing. But even the German attacks, although they did find their targets and they were during the day and they were, you know, staged quite well, were not focused enough or kind of capable of dropping the required bombing tonnage to really seriously damage the French military effort. They were more just kind of a, a nuisance on the French sort of military preparations in Paris. Along the front of the coming attack, which measured just under 200 kilometers, the Germans had arranged 90 divisions. However, 40 of these were in some level of reserve, and so the primary efforts, or the early efforts, would be made by 50 of the best divisions, including 10 panzer divisions, which had been so important to German successes up to this point in the war. 
While the original plans for Fall Rot, or, or Case Red, had been for the advances to move only to the Seine, the goals of the German mobile divisions had already begun to expand, with some of their objectives reaching out along the coast all the way to Cherbourg. On the French side, Vagon was able to bring together 49 divisions to put in the German path, which meant that at least, at least initially, the forces involved would be relatively equal, until the Germans brought in their reserves, because those 49 divisions represented almost every combat-capable unit that the French army or the British army could commit to the defense. There had been attempts to begin the reorganization process for the tens of thousands of soldiers that were now available after the evacuations from Dunkirk, but as always, this would take time. The largest problem that the French had in equipping these soldiers, or any new soldiers that, that were kind of brought into the military at this point, was finding the equipment for the units that had to be created. Infantry small arms were generally available, but the specialists' units and kind of the specialist equipment that was kind of essential to Second World War, even infantry divisions, like machine guns and anti-tank rifles, artillery, vehicles of all varieties, all of that was very scarce. To try and make some use of the men that had been evacuated from Dunkirk, they would even be forced to create what was called a, a light infantry divisions, and they were joined in these divisions by personnel from training schools and other kind of random sources of manpower. Even ignoring the complete lack of cohesion within these divisions, they were also far short of just about every type of equipment, all that specialty equipment that I just mentioned, they had very little of, which would make them far less capable when facing the Germans. The hope, the goal, the, the belief from the positive French military leaders was that these units, these newly created and sort of forming up divisions, would be given some time to recover and prepare before they were really needed. Because at the very least, the 49 divisions that were on the line, sort of you know, along the Somme, along the Anne, preparing to meet the German attack, were some good, solid, experienced, and they had good equipment, you know, they were regular army divisions, they were colonial divisions, there was a British division. They probably weren't the best troops that the Allies had, you know, three months before, because those had all been lost in Belgium, but they were far from the worst. They did, or they felt like, they had a real chance at defending against the German attack. Today's podcast is proudly sponsored by Fold3, the web's premier collection of military records that helps bring the events of World War II history to life. Immerse yourself in over 670 million records as you explore photographs, individual service records, formerly classified military documents, and more. Learn how the greatest generation's triumphs and sacrifices impacted history as you take a front row seat to epic tales of courage, sacrifice, resilience, and valor. Have a veteran in your family? On Fold3, you can combine records found on the site with what you have in your own albums and shoeboxes and attics to create an online memorial for someone who served. Discover your military ancestors today at Fold3.com. How do you feel when you switch to GEICO and save on your car insurance? It's like going to work on one Thursday morning and thinking to yourself, just one more day until Friday. But then somebody in the elevator says, happy Friday. Then you check your phone quickly and discover today is actually Friday. So yes, happy Friday, random stranger in the elevator. Happy Friday indeed. Yep, switching and saving with GEICO feels just like that. Get more with GEICO. In the early hours of June 5th, the pre-attack German artillery barrages began to fall at various points along the front. In the north, the two areas of focus were near the coast in the San valerie sur somme area and then around the bridgehead at Abbeville. This area of the front was primarily defended by the British 51st Highland Division, which had been brought in over the previous days to take part in the Battle of Abbeville, which had just finished. They were thinly spread through a series of fortified villages and other positions, and in retrospect, they were probably required to hold simply more frontage than they were capable of, but this problem was shared by many of the Allied forces at this time. This resulted in a British line that was constructed more like an outpost line, with small units thrown into a line that was not really strong anywhere, 
The only good news is that the 51st had a larger than expected allocation of artillery guns, 112 versus the expected 72, and there were still some units of tanks available as counterattack forces. The problem was that the troops in the front line found their ability to communicate with the artillery was often severely restricted, with some of the front line units losing all communications just hours after the start of the attack due to damage to their communication cables due to German artillery. All of this resulted in a very similar series of events along this sector of the front, with the British defenders hit first by the German artillery and then by German infantry, which would infiltrate through the widely dispersed defenses. Once this was done, the British units could either retreat as quickly as possible or risk being surrounded. Some of the surrounded units would find a way to kind of make their way to an escape that mostly kept them intact, but others were trapped, like the 7th Battalion Argyle and the Sutherland Highlanders, who would eventually be trapped completely and then bombarded into submission by German artillery. This scenario was mostly the same along the entire frontage of the 51st, with those on the left being pushed back or surrounded by the German 12th Infantry Division, while those on the right were experiencing many of the same things due to attacks by the newly arrived 32nd Infantry Division and the 57th Infantry Division that had resisted the British and French attacks at Abbeville over the previous days. The commander of the 51st Division, a General Fortune, requested that he be allowed to pull the entire division back to a line around the Bresel River. The French General Altmaier uh, agreed to this request, although he made it clear that he expected the Highlanders to hold the new line that they would then occupy at all costs. Altmaier, who was the commander of the French 10th Army, commanded the front from the North Sea to the south of Abbeville, and he had many things beyond just the 51st Division to worry about during this time. To make matters worse, some of the French units to the south of Abbeville were being attacked by German armored units. At least in the north, the biggest problem for the British and the French were the German infantry. Along the southern end of the 10th Army's line to the south of Abbeville, the French had constructed their defenses so that at various towns and villages, strong points had been created to act as centers of resistance, with at least some anti-tank guns present in many of those areas. But the defense was not perfect because there were not enough sort of artillery pieces to provide the support for all of the positions that they needed. And there were never enough anti-tank guns. But what was available was put to good use in the early hours of the attack. On a few areas of the front, like around Long pre anguest and Condé Foley, the French troops, many of them Senegalese troops from Africa, were able to hold their positions for most of the day, even though they were under constant attack from German tanks, including those of Rommel's 7th Panzer Division. Sadly, there were also accounts of the French colonial soldiers being killed after they were captured on this area of the front, and this phenomenon would not be in any way unique to just these units, or to just those villages. There were multiple instances of those kinds of atrocities during this stage of the campaign. To the south of Abbeville, and closer to the German bridgehead at Amiens, the French defenders would have similar problems, although in some areas the results would be far better. To the north and west of Amiens, the German Infantry Army Corps, commanded by General Manstein, would stage an assault crossing of the Somme with two infantry divisions. They would make their first crossings mostly successfully, using rubber boats to cross a section of the river that was only about 30 meters wide, but they immediately ran into problems. The area on the west side of the river was defended by the troops of the 13th Infantry Division and the 60th Reserve Division of the French Army. These troops had been spread even thinner than on other areas of the front because the terrain that they defended was quite wet and marshy, and so the assumption was that the Germans were less likely to attack through this area. This meant that in some areas, there, were, there was up to 500 meters sort of between French defensive positions with nothing really in the gap in between. That, that's a, a lot of space. The Germans were actually a bit surprised by how bad the ground was once their infantry got across the river and may have been in serious trouble if they had met any kind of strong and determined resistance. As it was, they met a determined resistance with some of the French infantry resisting the German attack for most of the day but the defensive line was far from strong, with some positions being overrun and surrounded quite quickly. But for both sides, the area of the front to the north of Amiens was kind of a sideshow. This was because both the French and the Germans put far more focus on the areas directly around Amiens. Here, the German 14th Armored Corps was prepared to make its attack starting in the early hours of June 5th, 
For the attack, there were three divisions, two panzer divisions, the 9th and the 10th, and then the 9th infantry division. The 10th panzer division was the strongest unit in Amiens and one of the strongest in the entire German army by this point in the campaign, and they would be met by the French 16th infantry division, a reserve formation, but one that was well equipped with artillery and anti-tank guns. The positions occupied by the 16th infantry was probably as close as the French could get in June 1940 to being the ideal defensive positions, what what they kind of wanted things to be. With a fortified zone being 10 kilometers deep, with every village in that zone fortified, defended not just by infantry, but by at least one anti-tank gun, and often more than one anti-tank gun. And all of this proved to be very fortuitous, and provides a kind of a potent example of what the French army was still capable of at this late stage of the fighting. When the 10th Panzer Division attacked forward, as as expected, when the tanks encountered a town that was heavily fortified, which all of them were, they did not attack into it, and instead pushed around to bypass those towns and to keep moving. This left the village and the towns to kind of be attacked by the infantry forces that followed the tanks. This was Totally reasonable, and both sides kind of expected this to happen. In many instances, this was exactly as well what the French wanted, because it meant that the German tanks were left without infantry support, and as they advanced, they found French anti-tank positions. In one instance, eight German tanks would be knocked out in a matter of minutes by just a few small 47mm French anti-tank guns. In other areas, the German tanks ran into anti-tank mines, which were capable of disabling even the largest and most powerful German tanks like the Panzer IV. While there were some successes, this sort of structure of the defense was a very dangerous business for the French soldiers, and while in some cases they were able to stop the German tanks, in others they were faced with overwhelming odds. For example, the 5th Battery of the 37th Infantry Division with its four 75mm artillery guns, would make their stand near a village. In the action that would follow, with German machine gun bullets hitting all around them, the 75mm guns would knock out 12 German tanks before all four of the guns were forced out of action. However, of the 32 artillerymen that were manning the guns, 28 of them would die in the effort. 28 out of 32. Heroic actions like those of the 5th Battery meant that even after a full day of attacks, the French defenses on the 16th Infantry Division's front were largely intact, and in fact the Germans had not really even been able to push through the second line of French villages. Most importantly, for the future, of the roughly 200 German tanks that the 10th Panzer had started the day with, only 90 of them were still running when sunset. This fighting, no matter how costly it was for the French, was exactly what they were hoping would happen all along the front. And unfortunately, this specific example of the 16th Infantry Division around Amiens would be one of the few areas where the French army would actually manage to make it happen. Another area of French success would be further south, near the bridgehead at Peron, where a similar story would end up occurring, only this time with the tanks of the 3rd Panzer Division and the French Infantry of the 19th Division. When the German attack began, after a bombardment from about 400 guns, they would focus their efforts on three villages that were in a pretty small area and defended by a single French infantry regiment. The French artillery would throw fire at the German as well to try and slow them down, which had a particular impact on the German infantry support, which, believe it or not, as would happen so many times, separated them from the tanks. Now the tanks of the 3rd Panzer Brigade would continue moving forward, but they would run into more and more French 75mm artillery pieces. In most of the small firefights that broke out between the French artillery and the German tanks, the outcome was never necessarily seriously in doubt. There were simply too many Germans, and they brought with them too much firepower. But the French guns were able to inflict some serious attrition on the German tanks, making them pay for every advance that they were trying to make. This meant that by the end of the day, While a few of the villages along the front had been taken by German infantry assault, the French were still holding out even after heavy casualties. German tank losses were also high, and just as importantly, they had still not achieved the expected breakthrough, so they would have to try again if they wanted to. One of the challenges that the Germans were having, or the problems that they were experiencing, 
at here at Peron and at Amiens, and even at areas where sort of the defense as a whole was less successful, but there were still some areas where the French were resisting quite strongly and quite, you know, successfully, was that there was a certain amount of frustrations that were filtering up from the units at the front and then to divisional and to corps headquarters and, and even higher. Uh, for example, General List, the commander of the German 12th Army, which occupied an area of the front further south than Perone, would write that, quote, the French are putting up strong opposition. No signs of demoralization are evident anywhere. We are seeing a new French way of fighting, end quote. This was a problem for the Germans because this is not what they were expecting. They were expecting kind of a similar quick victory to what they had experienced before. But that's not really what they were getting in these early attacks on several important areas of the front. The two main reasons for the French successes were first the change in defensive tactics with the defense in depth a sort of, of strong pointed villages proving to be a good way to slow the German attacks, even if it still resulted in many French casualties. The second reason was simply the resiliency of the French soldiers. The French forces along the Somme reacted quite differently than those on the Meuse had in the early days of the campaign. And this is something that the French themselves realized. A French army officer uh, who commanded an armored unit would write in a letter to his wife that, quote, We've taken a heck of a pasting, and there's hardly anyone left. But those still here have fantastic morale. We no longer think about the awful nightmare we've been through. That's typical of the French soldier. If you could only know the happiness of going into a scrap with chaps like these, end quote. A, a very positive quote, although, of course, when writing to family members, uh, men like to make things sound better than they are, <laughs> so you have, to, you have to kind of take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. After the partial successes and partial failures of the first day of the attack, the second day of the attack would largely be a story of two different sectors of the front. In the north, the situation, which had been precarious during the first days for the French and the British, continued to deteriorate, with the overstretched Allied forces unable to establish a firm defensive line overnight. This meant that the 5th and 7th Panzer Divisions were able to start making some serious headway around Abbeville. The last thing that the French wanted was for the German armored divisions to start gaining momentum, because once they did, they would be essentially impossible to stop. What the French had at the front was all they had, and their ability to react to any kind of major breakthrough was almost non-existent. And by the end of June 6th, the 5th and 7th Panzer we're starting to separate from French defenses in a very, very, very worrying way. Further south around Amiens, the situation actually looked much better for the French, with the 9th and 10th Panzer Divisions, after they'd had such heavy losses the day before, mostly just kind of taking their time to mop up some French resistance that had already been bypassed, instead of continuing to kind of seek out their way forward. Around Peron, the 3rd Panzer Division would present further bad news for the French, though, because while the first day had went okay, now they were advancing but much more quickly. After a aerial and artillery bombardment on several of the most important strong points in the French line, the 3rd Panzer Division started moving, and they would advance about 14 kilometers during the afternoon of June 6th. If that level of advance continued uh, into the next day, the Germans might find themselves all the way through the French defenses, and that meant disaster for the Allies. The French Air Force would do their best to try and help with, with some of these problems. They would launch 60 bomber attacks against the German forces in the area just around Peron, where the 3rd Panzer Division was trying to break out, but few of these sorties actually found their targets. There, there was one instance where eight French bombers caught the German tanks during a refueling sort of meetup with their tanker trucks, and the Germans would take some casualties during this time. But the overall impact on the sort of large advance out of Peron was minimal. For their efforts, the French also lost 17 of their bombers. The French fighters had a better day, though. Although they lost 14 fighters of, sort of over various areas of the front, they would at least be able to claim 20 German aircraft for their efforts. But given the fact that they were already heavily outnumbered, these kinds of trades, even if they were sort of taking more German aircraft than they themselves were losing, was never going to be a long-term win, right? The French could sustain essentially no attrition if they still wanted to have aircraft flying in the days ahead. 
Overall, at the end of June 6th, the situation at the front was very worrying for the Allies, but it was not yet, not yet, completely disastrous. Some areas of the front were still holding. The line around Amiens was doing quite well. They were at least sort of bending to the south of Peron. They were not totally broken. But there could be no denying that in a few areas, the German armored forces had started to make real progress. And in the days that followed, it would be difficult for the French to find any way to stop them, or even really to slow them down. 